In this episode, we talk about using stations or centers in the language classroom. Trudy Anderson joins me to walk us through the benefits and logistics of setting up stations. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom Podcast. I am Joshua Cabral. Quickly, before we get into this episode, I want you to look down at your phone right now and make sure that whatever app you're on, that you are following or subscribing or whatever it is they ask you to do to make sure that you get new episodes every Monday when they come out. So today on this episode, we are talking about stations, some teachers call them centers, in the world language classroom and what that can look like. So we might have these questions of why do stations or how do I do them or what level are they for? I've seen them in certain classrooms, but not others. What are the logistics of setting them up? I'm sure you have all those questions in your mind. So we are joined today by Trudy Anderson, who is going to help us find answers and give us incredible insights for all of those questions that come out when we think about stations. So Trudy is currently a Spanish teacher, although she has also taught French in Connecticut, and she teaches in the middle schools from sixth to eighth grade. And she has presented at a number of conferences. Uh, Some of them I've actually seen on this topic of stations from Nell to C.T. Colt, Mafla, uh, and Nectful. And just so that you are very well aware that we have the honor of having Trudy today because she is also the Connecticut Teacher of the Year for 21-22. So thank you so much, Trudy, for being with us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. So I would love for you to just fill in some of the blanks on the the teaching story of Trudy so we have a, a more robust understanding of, of this whole conversation. So I'm originally from Jamaica and I've been living here for quite a long time. I moved here when I was 15. And in my high school, we had to take both Spanish and French. And I really fell in love with languages, even though I didn't think that that was going to be the career that I would end up in. And when I moved here and I went to college, I realized that I was taking classes, science classes that I was not enjoying. And I was taking language classes for fun. And I decided that why not do the classes major in something that's very Mm -hmm. interesting and fun for me. So I switched to teach uh, to a Spanish major with a French minor and then went to grad school to become a teacher and now starting my 30th year of teaching. 30th year. Congratulations on that. Excellent. (laughs) So now let's jump into this conversation about stations. And before we even talk about the logistics and how it works. Uh, The big question always comes up about what levels and what students should be using or can effectively use stations in the classroom. And I would say it can be for every single level. After I started using stations in my classroom, my, our supervisor is Jessica Haxey and she talks about putting magic in our, in our lesson plans and I thought mm-hmm. how much magic really apply to what we do in our classrooms. So magic for her is having M is the movement, A using mm-hmm. authentic resources, G is using games, I is for interaction, and C is for challenge. And she said, if we put magic in our lesson plans, it's going to pull kids in. And I thought about all the things that I was doing with stations in my classroom and I realized that really does fit the bill that students actually really do love doing the stations in our classroom Mm -hmm. 
And when we use this term stations, what does that look like? So if I walk into a classroom where you're doing stations, what will I see? Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about what it was like before COVID and mm-hmm. some of the tweaks that I'm going to have to make because of okay. COVID. Okay. Okay. All right. So when my students, if I tell my students we're going to be doing stations that day in class, I would have them leave all their materials outside my door. And now that we all, all my students have laptops, it's easier. They just bring a laptop, something to write with. Mm-hmm. And when they walk in the door, they're going to see something posted with the groups that they're going to be in because they mm-hmm. have to move as a cohort from station to station. That's mm-hmm. one thing I'm going to have to make sure I stick with because of um, contact tracing. They they really, in our town, they're really big on knowing who's sitting beside whom. Mm-hmm. So before I would have kids move as they were done with things, but now I have to stick with you stay with your group until the timer is done. Mm-hmm. So they'll walk in, they'll see which group they're going to be with and where they're going to start. Before they come in, I would have put out, labeled all the stations that are in the room, all the materials that they'll need. So maybe an extra headphone, although I do ask my students to have headphones in in my class. The materials, if they need something to write, the papers with the directions and the activities on it. And all their activities would be listed on Google on a document in Google Classroom so they can access everything there. So then they would walk in, go to where they're supposed to start. Then uh, there's a, I usually with middle school would, because they read things, but they prefer if I explain it to them, might be different with high school students. Mm-hmm. I usually walk them through what every station is. This year, again, I've, I'm going to start making a screencastify of me giving the directions for them. Mm-hmm. Again, just because of COVID concerns of students, mm-hmm. all the moving around. And then the timer is set. They get to work on whatever particular station they're doing at the time. Now, one thing that we have to realize is that some students work slower than others some happen to move faster Mm -hmm. so i have told my students that even if the timer goes off and you're not done it's okay Mm -hmm. you're going to have to move if there's something that i really want you to get done because in stations i do not grade every single station that they do Mm -hmm. i think it's part of the discipline of learning to learn on your own but I do grade some of them. And if there's one that I really would like to grade, then you will get the opportunity to finish it. And so they move around the room as the timer goes. And then um, at the end, they're taught how to clean up everything so that it's Mm -hmm. all set for the next group that's coming in or Mm -hmm. clean up because I'm going to switch to another class and I'll be doing something else. Mm -hmm. So what are the benefits of structuring your class in stations rather than everyone doing one activity in groups, but all doing the same activity at the same time. The thing that I didn't think that much about when I started doing it, the whole idea of movement Mm. that they actually do like moving from one place to the other, even though they could have sat at their this, their seat and just switch to a new activity mm-hmm. they actually do like moving from one thing to another and they see that as something new as something different and they're ready to engage more mm-hmm. in what i'm asking them to do mm-hmm. so it's kind of different from doing a playlist where yes you switch activities and that's independent too but something about them moving engages their brain in a different way that I never really thought about before. We had our umbrella look of what the room looks like when we walk in. Now, can you take us to some individual stations so that we see what students are doing? So normally, I try to set up my stations using the things like really simple, Mm -hmm. a reading activity, 
or two, depending on how many, how big my class is. Because if in New Haven, the, the max is 27, and I prefer not to have more than four mm-hmm. students in a station because it could get kind of unruly then. So I just think four is enough. So I need to set up enough stations for them to be able to move through. So there would be some sort of reading activity, something they have to write. It could be a speaking activity Mm -hmm. or a listening activity. I Mm -hmm. also do games because my students, middle schoolers love games. So a a lot of, um, it could be Quizlet or quizzes or all, any kind of other games. It could be card games that they're, they could be doing. Also, there are times when I'm acting as a station. So I have a teacher station um, several times where the students come in and I get to talk with them. And I mostly use it for speaking because what I found is that as a teacher, I can usually get more out of a, uh, one of my students than them doing a mm-hmm. conversation with somebody else. So twice a year in New Haven, we have to gauge our mm-hmm. students' proficiency levels. And so especially during those times, since trying to check over 100 students' proficiency level takes a long period of time, that's some mm-hmm. of the times I will do it during stations where I get to interview them. Or there are times when I realize that students need a little extra help on certain topics and then I'm there in order to help them. Usually these questions are about logistics, because once we figure out the logistics and make it making it work, that's helpful. So when students are coming in and they're they're going to their stations, have you already spent time on the content, the topic, the structure, the vocabulary theme, and now they are working with it in stations, or do you have a part of the stations where they are actually engaging with new content for the first time? Most of the time, it's something they've already seen and now they're proving that they can do it. But there are times when I want them to figure something out because I think that's where the challenge in magic comes, Mm -hmm. where I don't have to tell you, I'm going to have you look at it and think about it on your own. Mm and see what you come up with. So, but most of the time it's stuff that they've seen, they've, they've, they know the vocabulary so, because that gives them a lot more confidence that they're walking in to something that they know. One thing I usually tell my students is there's challenge. I'm never going to give you something that you don't know mm-hmm. how to do or you can't figure out. So even if the listening activity is hard or they say it's hard it's speaking too fast or whatever it is I've taught them what to do in order to listen Mm -hmm. to something or to read something that's challenging for them so even though the first time they listen they usually freak out by the fourth time they listen to it they know how to tune in to get the answers that they need and when students are coming in, and I know that in COVID times, things are, they look a little differently in the classroom than maybe they did in the past, and hopefully we can get back to that. But when they come in pre-COVID, did they have a choice of where to start? Or do you tell them or sort of explain to them that you go through the stations in this order? How does that work logistically? I, I usually tell them where to start. So in pre-COVID, it depended on what my size was, so the size of the class was. So for example, in my Spanish 2 classes, which class, which was usually smaller, I would have the students move as they wished mm-hmm. because they had finished something or they needed to spend a longer time on something and they would move and do things at their own space, mm-hmm. pace. My Spanish 1A classes were a lot bigger. So therefore, to to not have chaos, I would say you move with a timer. And if you're if you're done, you can wait. If you're not, okay, it's okay to not be done and move on. But <clears throat> I do think that if there's a student who's a really fast finisher, I think it's it's prudent for it to have an empty station mm-hmm. in there so that you could send a child to to that empty station because you don't want to have somebody having too much time on their hands, not having something to Mm -hmm. do. So I do recommend having 
and I call it the empty station mm-hmm. where where there's an activity that they can go do while everybody else is is working on something else. So the expectation is that all the students will work through all of the stations. So they're not sort of having a choice. There are five stations, you do four. Or do you work that way too? It really does mm-hmm. depend. But for the most part, I expect that they're absolutely going to hit mm-hmm. the reading, writing, listening, mm-hmm. speaking. Those have to go because they want to see how you're progressing along there. If they don't get to a gaming station or if they mm-hmm. don't get to the just for fun station, if they put one in or something like that, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. So it seems that you're you're setting up the stations by mode, by the communication mm-hmm. mode. So you have them going in that way. And you had mentioned earlier that now you're having them go through with their groups of four and pods because they have to stay together. But previously it was more individual. Mm-hmm. So do you mm-hmm. do you have them set up so that students are working individually? Or are there stations where they do have to collaborate and work together as a group? For the speaking stations, they're going to be definitely working together as a group. But I really don't mind if they're in other stations that they they work with somebody else. The whole point is, especially if they're reading for some reading, for example, and they might be asking, "Well, what do you think this could be?" And they and they are interacting and talking about what things could be. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I don't mm-hmm. consider it cheating that they're working together to come up with the answers because one of the parts of magic is interaction. If they're talking about what I need them to talk about. I am glad that they are engaging with what I'm asking them to do. And that's what I'd like. So it's not mm-hmm. cheating. It's not a test. It's I want to see right. if you can figure something out. And what have you seen as an appropriate or useful amount of time in a station? And I'm sure it might depend on what they're doing in the station. What it is. Uh, but <laughs> I, I like to think of it personally for me is it's the tipping point. It's where it just it the, the attention just starts to fall apart a little bit. So what's that sweet spot of a amount of time for, say, students that are in the novice range? So I think somewhere about nine minutes. I remember when I was in mm-hmm. grad school, I remember a professor telling me, do not tell any child anything in round numbers. Don't tell them 10 minutes. Don't tell them 15. You tell them 10 minutes, they'll take 15. If you want them to take 10 minutes, tell them seven. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. around nine minutes, they can finish what I or get most of what I want done. And let's move to the next thing. As mm-hmm. I said before, if they're not done, you will have time to go back and finish something if I need you to do that. I know when I first attempted the idea of stations in my classroom i did not go about it the correct way (laughs) i had not had my conversation with trudy yet (laughs) um and i remember thinking early on that stations were meant for one class so everybody had to go through every station in one class period and then we did something new the different day a different day or the next day so can you talk us through logistically you've set up uh maybe five six stations how many stations would you have um again depending on my class size Mm -hmm. so i'd say never more than seven or eight never more. okay so you have seven seven or eight Mm -hmm. stations it's a novice high intermediate low class uh, of students across how many days would you use that set of stations so i usually go one or two days and Mm -hmm. if there's and and usually I do the two days with my Spanish two students more likely Mm -hmm. because their activities might be a little bit more involved. I found Mm -hmm. that my Spanish 1A students, remember I'm starting in sixth grade, they have shorter attention span. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's, for me, it's better to keep their activities to be a shorter activity. I've done stations over two days and that's perfectly fine, especially with something Mm -hmm. that I'm really I really think it's important that they complete and they know how to do it perfectly fine to do it over two days. I wouldn't do three days just because I think middle schoolers want a a new thing often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But possibly if we're looking at 
a high school class with sort of 15, 16, 17 year olds mm -hmm. getting up into the level fours and the AP they can perfectly where they that. could have a more sustainable amount of time, 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. It could be like with reading or speaking, it could possibly go over. We always have to keep in mind that developmental level. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. I think because I've been teaching middle school for so long, that's how I usually think what mm -hmm. they, they need. But for sure, mm -hmm. if you're, students can handle a longer time and they're reading a longer passage or watching a longer video. For me, my videos rarely hit five minutes. You know, it's mm -hmm. usually snippets that I, I have for them for under a minute, usually about three minutes the longest I would do for a novice student, especially the level one A students. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't need an extremely long time. Right. And for me, if I want them to listen to two video snips or two videos, I usually don't put them in the same station because again, the whole idea of something novel for them, if they move to another station, they say, oh, it's another mm -hmm. listening. And then they'll be willing to do that. And where are you finding the materials that you use in all your different stations? It can absolutely be anywhere. So I will start off with the easiest ones. I am a Pinterest devotee. And if there's a unit of study that I'm looking for, I spend hours going down the rabbit hole of let's click on this and see what that says and what else are they suggesting? Because sometimes on Pinterest, you might be looking for something and you're not finding exactly mm -hmm. what you want. But next week, they will send you exactly <laughs> what you want because you've been looking at certain right. types of materials. So I look at, I get things from Pinterest. I've gotten things from, for example, Zachary Jones. I'm a big believer mm -hmm. in YouTube videos and I'm amazed how much YouTube content and kids mm -hmm. are creating content on YouTube. So for example, we're doing something about school and there's this little eight-year-old girl. I don't remember what country was she's in, but she is doing her back to school haul in Spanish and talking about her first day and what she's wearing. She's mm -hmm. eight years old. Wonderful mm -hmm. Spanish content. And I could use that for my classes. I believe it or not, get materials from other classes. So a couple of years ago, I went to the copier room and there was this picture of Mr. Grinch mm -hmm. left on the copier. And it just had Mr. Grinch's face and circles, little bubbles around. And I said, oh my goodness, I can use this. It's from the kindergarten class. And I used it and students were able to write in words that would describe Mr. Grinch in the bubbles and write a paragraph describing Mr. Grinch. Mm -hmm. You can use kindergarten material, but I'm teaching younger students, but you can find materials anyway, I, anywhere. It could be a flyer. I live close to Bridgeport and there's a larger Spanish speaking population mm -hmm. there. There are new, free newspapers mm -hmm. outside the supermarket that you can pick up. You can use the yellow pages in Spanish. I remember going to a wedding one day and there was a sign on a flyer on the door of some place celebrating something about celebrating Hispanic Awareness Month. And I told my husband, stop. Mm -hmm. And I ran into the store and grabbed one of the flyers. You're in JC mm -hmm. Penny. I sent my son to go take a picture of a sign because it's there. If, if, I think if you look around you, especially for Spanish, there's so many things that you could use that my students would think it's worthwhile or a menu from a restaurant mm -hmm. that it's something that will hook them in because they go out to either restaurant they walk into jc penny they see things in their neighborhoods and students can be a resource i do something called spanish in the real world i saw some teacher on pinterest who had started doing it and so i say to the kids here's a flyer that i found in new haven and here are the things that are on it how about you for extra coupon points because I told them extra credit is against my religion, but I will give coupons for something that you do so they can find mm -hmm. flyers or different things around their neighborhood and they bring it in. I give them a five point coupon and I have extra materials they can use. There you go. Leveraging the feelers out in the community like that. I was mm -hmm. just thinking this morning I was coming back from uh, getting coffee. And when I went out the, on my windshield, there was a flyer in Spanish for a block party that's happening in the city that I live in. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay, there's an authentic resource exactly. right there. <laughs> 
it's so, everywhere. So I would love to hear where you continue to get your inspiration from. Like who are you looking to, who inspires you or conferences, anything like that? Well, I'm going to say my greatest inspiration is my supervisor, Jessica Haxey. I think Uh she's the most wonderful motivator of teachers to Mm -hmm. learn more, to do more, and to expand your practice. And she's Mm -hmm. just been wonderful for Mm -hmm. me. She's currently the Actful actual President, president, yes. Correct, right. Mm -hmm. And um, I like... As I said, I'm a devotee of Pinterest and there's so many people that I'm following that really are just so interesting to me because Mm -hmm. I think one really good thing as a teacher is that you always have to be ready to learn and that there are things that you don't know everything about. So Mm -hmm. it's good to visit, to go to conferences. So for example, last year, that was the first year I went to Nell and there's just one speaker there that just was so good and I went back to my supervisor and said, we've got to start doing this in our world language. Or mm-hmm. um, I this year I went to the Connecticut Cold Proficiency Institute for the first time. And I was just amazed at the learning with, from Greg Duncan mm-hmm. and other people who were there. And I just got introduced to Mike Travers' blog, the mm-hmm. Daria from uh, Mad Language Teacher. Right. Mm-hmm. And I've been really enjoying looking through that. So mm-hmm. I think... As teachers, no matter where, you just need to be looking for another way to learn because Mm. otherwise it gets stagnant. I've been teaching for a very long time. And yes, some of the things that I've done in the past, they can continue using it. But students have changed. Their attention span is not as much as it used to be. They want to be entertained while they're more while they're learning. And Mm -hmm. I have to adapt myself to their learning styles even more. Excellent. As I ask teachers on the podcast about their inspiration, there are so many shout outs to the state language associations. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I so much appreciate that that happens Mm -hmm. because there's so much great work is happening there. And I know in Connecticut, you have a wonderful uh, organization there. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now is the time I like to pull back the teacher curtain a little bit <laughs> and get to know Trudy the person with a little part I like to call this or that. So mm-hmm. I'll give you two choices. You just kind of weigh the options and choose this one or that one. So the first one here is when a story or a movie is ending, do you prefer to have everything tied up and clear or are you okay with it being open-ended? moving forward has to be tied up and clear has to be (laughs) I was just thinking of a book club book we just had last month and I hated the book because of the ending (laughs) she didn't Uh, know what happened oh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I I enjoy a nice tidy ending myself I would have to agree with that ending it should be clear what it is (laughs) Mm -hmm. I don't like to get to the end of me thinking but what wait wait there's not another if there's another book maybe but if that's the end (laughs) We don't have to do yeah. that. Uh, do you like to cook? Absolutely not. Oh. I absolutely hate cooking. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> when you do cook, um, <laughs> so maybe this is going to be an easy one for you. Do you clean as you go or do you clean when you're done? Or maybe you get someone else to do it all together. Oh, my goodness. That is an, a constant source of bickering between my husband and myself because... <laughs> I do it at the very end and he doesn't understand why anybody (laughs) would do that. Because you want it to be all cleaned up in the end and the final piece, just like a book. (laughs) Exactly. But he just doesn't understand my way of doing things. Uh Okay. So now this last one, you're a contestant on Jeopardy. My, I'm going to be on that show before I die. Okay. Oh, good. (laughs) See, now this one hit the mark. Are you going to do better with the math and science categories or the history and humanity? History humanities. and humanities, for yeah. sure. That's going to be your that's mm-hmm. going to be your sweet spot on there. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And what would you hope the uh, final Jeopardy category would be? Something about books. Uh huh. Books. For Are sure. you do you prefer fiction, nonfiction, or a mix when it comes to reading? I am more a fiction person, but this year I've introduced a lot more nonfiction, which surprised mm-hmm. me. But I'm mm-hmm. 
purely, I am almost purely fiction. Wow. Yeah, I was kind of the opposite for years. I was all nonfiction. And since the pandemic, I turned to fiction more. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit of an escape, I guess. Right? Excellent. So uh, I'm sure that some of our listeners may have uh, questions for you or would like to connect with you as they're trying these things out. Is there a way they can get in touch with you? So um, I my e my email that I check for all of these things, Trudy Cam C A M A N D at gmail.com. Thinking about joining Twitter, I just keep putting it off, but I think I'm gonna join. Okay. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your time today, taking the time out of your day to be with us and to talk about these stations and these actionable tips and looking at the logistics of it. So I really appreciate your time with us today. Thank you so much. Yes, you're very welcome. If you've been thinking about using stations, I hope you're now inspired to try them out. I appreciate the addition of the teacher stations so that we can have that teacher student conversation time. Be sure to check out the show notes where you'll see a link to sign up for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.